Uh, welcome, everyone. We're just going to give people a few seconds to jump on. Um, we're thrilled that you're all here. So again, welcome for the folks who are just jumping on. We're just going to give people another few seconds uh, as people join us. So thank you. I think, uh, 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 so I, th I think we will we will get started. My name is Stephen Rothstein. I'm the managing director of the series Accelerator. Thank you all for being with us today. We have an incredibly distinguished panelist. Um, th this program is being recorded, so it will be shared with all of you later. It's also closed captioning, and I want to encourage you, if there are questions, to put them in the Q&A. We probably won't get to them till later, but I promise we'll either answer them during this or, or later on. Next slide, please. Um, that we have, as I say, when I say distinguished panelists, we have two distinguished commissioners, both from California and Connecticut. Um, we have the founder and CEO of Manifest Climate, Laura, all the way from London, David Carlin's joining us from the UN. Um, Sharon's joining us from Manny Life in Toronto. Kara from uh, the uh, California Department of Insurance as Michael from the California Department of Insurance. So they're, they're, uh, I'm humbled to be with all of them. Thank you all for your expertise and partnership. Next slide. Um, many of you we've had a chance to work with, series of the nonprofit. We've been around for almost 35 years. We work with a lot of the capital market leaders, including insurers and uh, insurance regulators to solve some of the greatest sustainability challenges. I won't go through the detail. And, and, and now next slide, uh, we have a large company network, some of the largest companies, including some insurers and banks and others that we work with, some of the largest investors with over $50 trillion of assets, policy network, and so much more. Next slide. Um, and then the series accelerator, uh, we work on, again, focusing on the capital markets from banks and, and insurers and others. I won't go through all the details now. So if we can take down the slides, and it's a pleasure to welcome, as I say, our two commissioners from both coasts, from uh, Commissioner Lara from California and Commissioner Mays from Connecticut. And first, welcome to both of you, Commissioner Lara, Commissioner Mays, welcome to both of you. Thank you for having us here. Um, so let me start with Commissioner Lara with you and, and then, then go to Commissioner uh, Mays. Um, so the U.S. regulators have been implementing a climate risk survey since 2010. Can you give us a little history and context and why the change to TCFD was so important, Commissioner? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. And I'm also here in my capacity as the president of the Commissioner Mays fan club. And so thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Um, you know, and thank you to Ceres for your partnership on this important work. The This report is one of uh, several steps that we're taking really to address climate risks. And last year, I worked with other insurance commissioners to update our climate risk reporting to really be more consistent with what nations are doing and what you, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission is pursuing for their financial sector. So I'm really proud to say that we did this in a bipartisan way with really broad support and our, uh, a strong new climate risk, risk standard, uh, you know, gives regulators a powerful tool to really protect consumers and our planet. And I would say that this report is valuable because it, it will help insurance regulators and the public really better understand how insurance companies are preparing for climate related risks to the U.S. insurance market, which is Obviously, we know the largest in the world. And insurance companies really can learn from uh, other industry leaders as they expand their reporting and adopt sustainable strategies, including new products, for example, that can reduce risks and really safeguard communities. So our TCFD survey creates consistency with other financial regulators and provides the flexibility to give, to get the information, I should say, on insurance-specific questions. Uh, the report clearly points to where there is progress and where insurance companies can improve how they report climate risks. And in just the first year of our TCFD aligned survey, we are seeing a much greater level of detail from insurance companies, which made the review and the analysis in our report possible. So I think, you know, moving forward, we will continue to learn more about the multiple risks facing insurance the insurance sector and keep insurance 
regulators at the forefront of determining climate risk and resiliency. Uh, as you said, uh, you know, you know, we we started here in California started administering the climate risk disclosure survey over a decade ago, and uh, for its first ten years, we had a few states participating. And when I took office, one of my top priorities at the national level was to really expand the participation in this survey with uh, the reality that climate change is not just a, a global threat, but one that is really affecting every single state in our, in our union. And so since 2020, many states have joined the survey, which demonstrates the value of collaboration and coordinating among US state regulators through the NAIC. And in 2019, we had, just to give you an example, in 2019, we had six states implementing the survey. In 2022, the collaboration had grown to 15 states and 80% of the US insurance, uh, insurance market submitting resp responses. The next year, we're gonna have 27 states. And that's really a substantial progress from six participating states to 27 states. Uh, and jurisdictions in just three years. And it's really a bipartisan uh, accomplishment. So, uh, you know, the, the TCFD standard makes climate disclosure more understandable, as we all know, and usable for regulators. Uh, our challenge is that the responses provide diverse and detailed inf information about the way the individual insurance companies are managing climate risk. But with so many responses, it can be, again, difficult to pull out interesting pieces without getting lost. So we want we want this information to be accessible and useful for insurance regulators and for other stakeholders. If uh, information is uh, is accessible and understandable, you know you get we better we get better climate risk disclosure that will lead to better risk management with substantial benefits to the public. So again, just in closing this report uh, serves a, a map to navigate the responses, helping us ensure that our efforts, and priorities as a department and our collaborations as U.S. state uh, insurance regulators are directed, are really directed and, and really, I, I would say directed effectively. So with parts of the U.S. in the third or fourth week of some of the most extreme heat in history, we know that climate risk management is essential year round, it, it's, and it's got to be a year round priority. That's why we're where uh, ongoing, this ongoing partnership with Ceres is, I think, to me, very valuable and, and very you know, forward-looking. And so by working together, we're gonna be making climate risk information more understandable, more relatable for our insurance sector. Uh, thank you. Thank you, no, that's great. Uh, Commissioner Mays, do you wanna add anything to this before I jump to the next question? I don't know. Well, the, the one thing I would say is uh, that I certainly find that it's a privilege to be here with Commissioner Laro, who's been a national and international leader on this. And with you, Stephen, and for those who don't know, Sirius has been a partner, not just of California, but of Connecticut and a number of other states working together. You've been an integral part of the Connecticut Conference on Climate Change and Insurance that we've held, and your support has been invaluable. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you, Commissioner Mays. And for folks who don't know, in addition to Commissioner Lara's national leadership role at, at NAIC and the uh, and internationally, uh, Commissioner Mays is taking on a national role at NAIC as well as the, I think, incoming president. Is that right? President-elect. President-elect, I apologize. Serving. Yes. Well, next year I'll be president. And that's when Ricardo right. will be calling me again. But uh, <laughs> and uh, I also serve internationally on the executive committee of the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, which echoes what we do here, as Ricardo well knows. This is not a issue that any one state or any one country can address, any one industry for that matter. It, regard, it requires a holistic approach, and it requires each and every single one of us, in this case, to be our own risk manager to deal with this existential threat. Right. We're talking about the report. Many of you have seen it. If you haven't, um, I'll ask one of my colleagues to put the link in the um, 
in the in the link so you can take a look. You can also go to series.org and look under new reports. And, and then there are two documents there. There's one that goes through the almost 500 insurers that have submitted TCFD. And then there's a, a, a spotlight on 15 to go from there. Um, briefly, Commissioner Lara, um, how does this fit with your overall efforts in California and or NAIC to address the growing uh, financial risk that climate presents? Absolutely. And, you know, I would also just say that, you know, we recently got together in Colorado Springs where we had a very robust debate in terms of uh, where as as U.S. regulators, uh, how are we going to take a much more proactive uh, approach and be much more uh, forward thinking when it comes to the the uh, climate and, and resiliency? And uh, as uh, Commissioner uh, Mays can agree, it was really inspiring to see all of us, regardless of you know, whether we're red or blue state, really for the first time, I think really acknowledge that this is a major issue for us and that we have to stand united in terms of protection gap, data gaps. Uh, and so you're gonna see uh, uh, a very uh, united front when it comes to these issues at NAIC. And, and I would say the Climate Risk Disclosure Survey is just one piece of that comprehensive approach to addressing climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, you know, here in California, I created the first of its kind sustainable insurance roadmap that we developed with the UN that includes actions towards five goals, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, strengthening tools and for transparency and oversight and financial oversight, accelerating sustainable investment strategies, and really catalyzing sustainable insurance products and building climate resilience within our own communities. The information in uh, the 2022 disclosures is really critical to our overall actions to maintain reliable insurance in our market and to protect consumers. I'll just give you a quick example. You know, One thing in the climate risk response is that while insurers provide good information about their strategies for managing climate risk, we see less specific, uh, le less specificity around scenario analysis. So insurers and regulators should be using all the tools at our disposal to understand and address climate change, including scenario analysis. At the NAIC, we're focusing on these tools in our jurisdiction. The NAIC Climate and Resiliency Task Force has a solvency work stream led by Commissioner Bahrain from Maryland that is reviewing different scenario analysis and insurance supervisory tools. California, again, is one of the many states and, and jurisdictions contributing to that collaborative effort that will build upon the uh, important role of U.S. regulators as supervisors of insurer solvency. Again, scenario analysis is also an area where California, I'm proud to say, is leading. We just developed a new uh, approach that really uh, complement the climate risk survey. In April, UC Berkeley Law released a new report that my department commissioned the report focuses on the insurance sector and makes design recommendations that can help guide long-term strategies for advancing climate scenario analysis within our insurance market. So we now are working to implement the first of these recommendations by doing, uh, by doing a climate stress test using multiple climate scenarios. And these climate risk disclosures are consistent. So folk, it's a focused tool that we can use uh, to monitor, review, and improve upon our initiatives. So today's report is really a helpful uh, to California, of course, and to all the state regulators to help us inform how we understand the emergent strategies around our jurisdictions. Thank you, Commissioner. And Commissioner Mays, let me ask you, how will TCFD help you, whether it be in Connecticut or in your leadership role at NAIC? Well, let me start off by providing a little context here because I think it's, it's important. At the NAIC, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, we've got 56 different regulators, chief insurance regulators. It's a vast uh, array of different terrain, both politically and geographically. Everybody's got a different combination of climate risks in their jurisdictions, and they're looking on, everyone's working on solutions that will help protect policyholders. And I think this is a great example of how we as state regulators, and yes, I am president-elect of the NAIC, so I'm kind of patting myself and Commissioner Laura on the back here, 
but we continue to lead when it comes to climate risk disclosure. Commissioner Lara has he mentioned, he's done so much over the years as commissioner in California in general, just sitting here in New England and Connecticut between New York and Massachusetts where Superintendent Harris is, uh, has done a tremendous amount of work as well on climate risk. And in Massachusetts, Commissioner Gary Anderson has led both nationally and internationally. We're all members of the UN, UNDP Sustainable Insurance Forum. There is so much that we have done and we will continue to do. Here in Connecticut, of course, we've been a long running member of the states that administer the Climate Risk Disclosure Survey. And as uh, Commissioner Laura noted, the number has jumped tremendously in terms of the number of states participating. And I do have to give a member of my staff credit here, Assistant Deputy Commissioner George Radner, who reached out to all the New England states, and he got almost all of them to participate because we know that it is vital that we have the information as regulators in order to properly assess and manage the risk of climate change and to see the different strategies that our companies are employing to address those risks. And it all goes back to consumer protection. We have to make sure consumers are protected, and that covers a vast array of sins. You know, the, with, by using the TCFD reports, clearly we are going to become better informed on the markets we regulate, and we can consider policy options to more effectively protect those communities. One thing that I find important is a certain degree of standardization. Yeah, as uh, Commissioner Laura said, the TCFD provides a baseline template and we've included some insurance questions so that we know that there is a particular focus on the industry. Because, you know, from our viewpoint, access to insurance, affordable, available insurance is vital. And with a survey, the climate risk disclosure survey, the, you know, it enhances transparency. I think to anybody reading your report, and I would completely agree with you, I would encourage anyone who has not seen it to take a look on it, but it enhances the transparency about how our insurers are gonna manage the risk and the opportunities. It helps identify good, good practices. Everybody knows what good practices are or think they do until they see who's doing what. It's a way to share the information on best practices and vulnerabilities. It provides a baseline supervisory tool for us all. And Thank have... you. Oh, sorry. All right. I apologize. No, 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 I was going to say thank you. I know that both of you are, are busy and you have to run. So I could literally spend the next hour just talking to both of you, but we want to move on. So thank you both for your leadership. Thank you both for joining us today and, and look forward to talking to you both soon. With that, I'm going to turn to our international colleagues that last year as part of the training, we worked closely with David Carlin, who, as I said earlier, is at the UN. And if you are, if you have questions, there's a 10 hours of recorded training, five two-hour sessions that David led. They're on our website. And again, we're happy to share that with anyone. They're all free to look at if you have questions about TCFD. So with that, David, just give us a sense of the international. How does this report fit into what you're seeing internationally with TCFD? And thank you again for joining us at this late hour. Yeah, um, Stephen, it's it's a pleasure to be here and um, really wonderful to be here with the commissioners and with the, the team that put this together. Um, as I was reviewing this report, I was I was really struck by by all the progress that's been made in really an impressively short period of time. When we think about just a couple years ago, we had a handful of insurers that were reporting in the U.S., and we typically saw a lot greater uptake uh, in Europe, in the U.K., in Japan of the TCFD of those recommendations. So to really jump to this 80% number to really see these um, expectations being brought in effectively, that is, um, I think, not only tremendous progress, but I think helps bring the US not only up to speed, but really into that comparable leadership space on insurance related disclosures. I think what we're gonna continue seeing now in this international context is both the emergence of mandatory standards. We'll be keeping an eye out for what happens in the US with the SEC, but also in Europe, we see the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and the associated um, ESRS or the, um, the Environmental and Sustainability Reporting Standards, how that is going to play a, um, a role in 
not only upping the expectations of what is required, but really providing more usable information. And I think that this is very much the direction as we heard from the, the commissioners as well, that we'll need to go from not only making these disclosures, but using them. And I think that was to me what was so interesting about this report was really thinking about what does it say as a potential user, as a decision maker, as a stakeholder of these organizations about their disclosures. So that to me is, you know, where where we are today. I'll I'll say a few words about the recent announcement from the IFRS Foundation. I see a couple questions in the chat about that. And, and so just wanted to, to quickly note the international context there. So the IFRS um, Foundation has been convening since, um, since the Glasgow COP in 2021, COP26, the International Sustainability Standards Board, which really has been looking at creating interoperability and clarity around sustainability reporting. They released two standards, one broader on environmental and social topics um, called S1, and one specifically focused on climate called S2. That S2 disclosure, um, as well as S1, uses the four pillars of TCFD, and that S2 disclosure uses the 11 recommended disclosures under each of those pillars and really is aiming to elaborate on them. So what I see is many people have asked, do we have to do both a TCFD report and an ISSB report? And the real answer to that is the ISSB is simply giving further guidance, further expectations, and those who are doing leading TCFD reports, including scope three, considering scenario analysis, will see those things reflected in the ISSB's guidance. And so it's also notable that the TCFD itself, which had been created by the G20's Financial Stability Board and had been supported by a secretariat, now that work on observing global progress and assessing that progress will move to the ISSB itself. So rather than fearing a issue of interoperability, I think what we have here is a highly coherent and um, very, very successful transition from what was the TCFD to now the ISSB S2, but really to see those two as being very much of the same frame and that effective disclosures for ISSB S2 will be very similar in terms of what they ask for as what we've seen um, from this report and, and from those who are making TCFD disclosures. Great, well, David, thank, thank you both for your leadership the important work of the, of the UN, your training you did last year, that was very, very helpful. And again, that's available, it's free on, on our website and for this international context, it's, it, it is impressive. I give the regulators and the insurers enormous credit for how far they've come for all the reasons that's been said. So I'd love to spend more time with you, but I'm gonna move on in the interest of, of time. Um, and so Kara, let me first go to you. Kara's with, with the California Department of Insurance, as I say, and again, deserves an enormous amount of credit for this. Um, and then we'll go to, to Laura at Manifest Climate to go through this. So Carol, I'll turn it over to you. And with that, if I can ask my colleague to put the slides back up. Thanks, Stephen. So with over 1,500 companies now submitting responses to the public database of climate risk disclosure surveys, there's a lot of risk and resilience information that's available um, to inform how we as insurance regulators at the California Department of Insurance, um, as well as other state regulators, understand risk management strategies in the insurance sector. Of those about 1,500 companies, many of them provide responses in groups, but this still results in hundreds of unique reports. So to broadly be able to review the responses and gain insights efficiently, we really needed the help of computer programming tools and methods. But there are different methods that have different capabilities and strengths. And so there's value in conducting multiple types of review as we've done here. And that will provide a foundation for future efforts and me methods development. So in light of that, the California Department of Insurance and Ceres each took different approaches, but complementary approaches to review the responses. And we've published the results together to really leverage the strengths of each and the different perspectives of our organizations. Before launching into the results, I just wanna note that aligning the climate risk disclosure survey with the TCFD recommendations and that framework really gave us that clear criteria that was needed to be able to effectively review the responses with each of these methods. And so I'm just gonna take a minute to go over the framework here for anyone who might not be as familiar. 
Next slide, please. The TCFD recommendations are divided under four categories of disclosures or pillars, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. Each of these pillars includes two or three specific recommended disclosures, adding up to 11 recommendations in total. The TCFD organization itself also provides specific guidance on what should be disclosed for each of these recommendations, including supplementary guidance that provides further details for insurance companies and asset managers. The climate risk disclosure survey questions, which are the ones asked by the states, are broadly aligned with the TCFD framework, prompting much of the same information, while indicating that filers should reference the TCFD for additional guidance. The climate risk disclosure survey questions also request some information that's specifically relevant to the insurance sector and of interest to US state insurance regulators, but may not be directly referenced in the TCFD framework or may not be emphasized quite as heavily. Next slide. So for the first method of review, Series commissioned Manifest Climate to use an artificial intelligence or AI tool to review the responses. The Manifest Climate AI algorithm alignment metric is trained on TCFD aligned climate risk reporting to identify sentences, words, or phrases in reports that are broadly aligned with each of the 11 TCFD recommendations and provides a number representing how many of the 11 recommended disclosures were present in each report. Since the algorithm is trained on TCFD aligned reporting, but not specifically on climate risk disclosure surveys, it excels at providing fast results for alignment with the TCFD framework, but does not specifically evaluate the detail of disclosures and isn't tailored to identify insurance specific information. However, Manifest Climate does have capabilities for a more detailed review, and one such example is going to be presented by Laura Zizzo next um, from a separate report from Ceres that does a deep dive on 15 of the insurance companies that we reviewed that had really high alignment metrics. So for the second method of review, the California Department of Insurance independently analyzed the TCFD responses using a rules-based text mining approach. In order to understand the level of detail or the comprehensiveness of the responses using specific criteria from the Climate Risk Disclosure Survey and insurance company guidance. This approach was developed by researchers at Banco de España for reviewing climate risk reporting among Spanish financial institutions. It uses a language of computer programming that's commonly been used for years known as Python. The rules-based approach necessitates developing criteria or rules that align with key concepts of interest that relate to each of the TCFD recommendations. The rules are made of combinations of overarching labels that are applied to words with a common meaning. So in this example on the figure, a key concept under the governance pillar related to the recommendation on senior management oversight of climate risk might indicate that companies should disclose how frequently the committee responsible for climate risk management meets. The rule developed for this concept might contain the overarching labels of sustainability committee and periodicity that are applied to varying words with that similar meaning. If a report has the content consistent with that rule, it's assigned a number of points for that rule, and the points are added up for each key concept and normalized to 10 to produce an indicator of the TCFD recommendation. That indicator can then be related to categories of comprehensiveness from the report, and this will be shown in um, examples in later slide. Next slide. Launching into the key findings. The responses really demonstrate diverse strategies employed by insurance companies for climate risk management. There is no one size fits all approach for climate risk management, and that was really evident in these responses. There were examples of individual insurers with varying types of business that provide detailed disclosures on their climate risk management activities and aligned their responses with each of the recommendations of the TCFD framework. So while the property and casualty lines are often thought of as the business type that's initially um, in conjunction with climate risk, life insurers actually often provided very sophisticated responses on their processes for climate risk management and especially on their metrics and targets. Of the four TCFD pillars, insurers consistently provided information on their risk management and on their strategy, but did not often provide information on their metrics and targets. Therefore, metrics and targets is a pillar where additional capacity building, tangible examples, and educational resources could really ensure that insurance companies 
are adopting appropriate metrics and targets for their business and are disclosing these in their climate risk disclosure surveys. There's also really specific information in these responses that may be of interest to state regulators or may give regulators more concrete evidence to inform or support or refute their current understanding of trends in the sector. So for example, many insurers in their report describe purchasing reinsurance as one of their strategies, their primary strategy, or their only strategy for managing climate risk exposure. Simultaneously, responses representing companies that provide reinsurance often describe reducing reinsurance offerings or repricing as one of their primary strategies for managing climate risk, and some already describe doing this. As another example, insurers describe relying on their reinsurance provider for climate risk education, management advice, scenario analysis, risk data, and other climate-related risk management capacities. This is something regulators may want to be aware of when considering how to build capacity for climate risk management in the sector, especially among smaller insurance companies. Insurers are offering products that support risk reduction among their customers or support clean energy technology. And these offerings take a variety of forms that are described in more detail in the report. Additionally, engagement of insurers with consumers is another theme of interest in the report. And regarding that engagement of um, insurance companies with policyholders on climate risk, many companies respond by describing their free loss prevention consultation services that they provide to consumers although they often say that they don't directly do outreach that discusses climate change with their consumers. Next slide. Diving into some of the quantitative results, as mentioned, the Manifest Climate AI algorithm provided the number of TCFD recommended disclosures out of a total of 11 that are found within each report. And this figure shows how many reports had a given number of recommendations. So 63 reports out of nearly 500 represented by that top bar provided information on all 11 of the TCFD recommendations across governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. You can see in this figure that a lot of weight is focused up high in the chart. In fact, 78, the majority, 78% of the reports provided information on six or more of the TCFD recommendations. This is only the first year that the survey questions have been aligned with the TCFD, and we expect this kind of alignment to grow over time in future years. Next slide. Breaking up the results by pillar, the vast majority of the reports, 95%, provided some information on risk management and strategy, while very few, less than 40%, provided any information on metrics and targets. There was also more detail on the risk management and strategy pillars than on the metrics and targets pillar. Next slide. Now we're switching over to the results of the California Department of Insurance's analysis of the responses using the rules-based text mining approach to compare those responses to specific criteria. The colors in this figure show different lines of business, and there are examples of moderately and mostly comprehensive responses from all types of business, meaning that they fulfilled many of the criteria in our rules-based text mining method. So there are examples that all lines of business can learn from. However, many of the responses are minimally comprehensive, shown in that middle bar. So there are certainly opportunities to improve clarity and comprehensiveness in future years. Next slide. I also just wanna note that in the report, the results from both methods are broken down by individual TCFD recommendation. Those were the 11 separate recommendations. Since there's substantial variation within those four pillars of governance strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. So for example, in the strategy pillar, the responses on risks and opportunities and on the impact of the climate on the on of climate on the organization, those are the first two recommendations, are more comprehensive than the recommendation related to resilience of the organization strategy under different climate scenarios. That latter recommendation prompts information on scenario analysis. So this is clearly an area for additional attention and clarification on specific approaches. We also found that about 20% of the responses describe scenario analysis and climate stress testing, with some companies analyzing physical risks, some analyzing transition risks, a few analyzing litigation risks, and others including multiple risk types. Next slide. 
Finally, I'll close noting just two additional overarching points and then pass on to Laura. First, one goal of the report we released this week is to review the most recent submissions to the Climate Risk Disclosure Survey to enable regulators to better understand the contents for and for insurance companies to establish resources that would help them improve the quality of their responses in future years. To serve this purpose, there's a list of key concept questions in the appendix that represents the criteria used in the rules-based text mining approach, and then can act as a reference for future TCFD aligned responses. Second, the report does benchmark the alignment results with the 2022 TCFD status report, which is the annual report published by the TCFD organization and includes results of an AI alignment metric for reports from other sectors and geographies. The results indicate that the Climate Risk Disclosure Survey responses elicit more TCFD-aligned information than other sectors and geographies, which is really an encouraging, really encouraging and provides really good momentum um, for the future. And with that, I'll hand it off to Laura Zuzzo from Manifest Climate to talk about their deep dive on 15 of the companies with high alignment metrics. Awesome. Thanks, Kara. Um, we can go to the next slide. Really happy to be part of this discussion and talk about how we can learn from um, climate-related financial disclosures. We'll go to the next slide. We talked a lot about these four pillars, and I really like to start any discussion about how we think about disclosures by going back to this, because metrics and targets, the way that we think about the numbers is really the tip of the iceberg. What was interesting about what we saw from this report was there is a lot of disclosure from insurance companies on that like under the water piece of risk management strategy and governance, but still not enough on the governance side of things. So we'll go to the next slide. I'm a lawyer by training. I really like the regulatory um, push of this. I didn't think I'd be a software founder when I went to law school. But what I realized was we were talking about climate-related financial risk and legal risk in very disparate ways. And the TCFD and some of these questions that are aligned with the TCFD through the survey, for instance, um, are really bringing a standardized approach to how we think about climate-related risk and opportunity. So we were really um, pleased to be able to partner with Ceres on this research project and just a little bit about um, how we did this. We built an AI-powered software engine that really takes this expertise that we've had from our legal and consulting backgrounds and puts it into something that can provide comparable analysis um, for disclosures. Next slide. So for this study, we utilize, as Kara said, the um, AI to do the broader review. And we've also done that at a larger scale across various industries. So I just wanted to point out our disclosure benchmark. This is um, the, the uh, description on the right of the screen. And so we went for thousands of organizations across sectors and you're seeing similar results, right? Not good enough disclosure, but also points to the insurance sector doing very well. And for this project, we did um, a detailed analysis of these 15 companies. So quickly, I'll kind of tell you what we learned from this. Next slide, please. And how we did this, we selected 15 companies, as Kara said, from the broader 450. We reviewed against 200 TCFD aligned data points. So not just the 11 disclosures, but what are they actually getting at when they're asking for governance disclosures, strategy disclosure, risk management, and then metrics and targets. We pull these into 23 action item indicators. And to give a sense of how we pull out these 23 action item indicators, the governance related indicators are listed here on the right. So that's just governance. We have the same for strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets. So we go into detail about board awareness, oversight, how they're making decisions, management's role, management's workflow. There's more detail about um, all of this in the report. So what did we find? The next slide. We It was a really interesting um, thing because we took the ones that were best disclosing, but really, although they broadly disclosed, there was notable, notable gaps in the decision utility of what companies are saying. There's good disclosure um, of the risks and opportunities identified by these companies, especially with respect to resource efficiency, products, and services, which I think is probably unique in the insurance sector because this management of climate risk is really a part of a core business of many of the companies. But we didn't get comprehensive disclosure from any of the companies on governance. So how the companies themselves are governing climate-related risk and opportunity. There's definitely some work to do there. Only one company disclosed a very well-defined process for boards to consider these risks and opportunities in the executive decision-making process. Um, and only three 
disclosed um, the assignment of climate related responsibility to C suite executives, presidents, or executive committees. Many discussed financial planning of climate impacts. Only five of the 15, though, talked about transition plan. And I, I, the, one of the commissioners mentioned the importance of scenario analysis. That same number, only five, talked about detailed scenario analysis disclosure. Um, one thing I did want to mention, I should have mentioned this before, we only looked at a small sampling um, of the available disclosure from these companies based on what series provided us for, for this, so that it was comparable across all the organizations. So there very well be more, might be more disclosure from these companies in the public realm that was just not covered in our review. We looked at the TCFD reporter survey response for each of the 15 companies, but they may have relevant disclosure in other places that was not picked up by this review. Next slide. And lastly, there was good disclosure on short-term risks, few provided detailed disclosure on physical risks over longer time horizons. We talked about so the, the kind of nascent scenario analysis disclosure that we saw. Um, only two companies disclosed climate-linked compensation. So how are the management teams actually incentivized to think about climate? Uh, and 12 of 15 integrated climate risk into their ERM process. So that's a very common way that we're thinking about good disclosures um, around climate risk. There's a few other things on the slide here you can read, but I wanted to point us all to, and I'll put this in the chat, um, we were able to share the very detailed data points of our review um, in an online tool. So please feel free to go into that benchmarking application. We're sharing the results and, and hopefully you can see more detail of, of how we pulled out this information. But again, really appreciate the leadership of the insurance sector and series and happy to, to be involved in this process. Congratulations on the great work. Thanks, Laura. Uh, great. Thank you so much. And thanks, Kara. Both incredible presentations, both of you. So, so, so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, just in terms of one of the last points that was just said, what for the data here, it was what was filed for under the TCFD process. A company may have issued a press release or put something else out. If, it, if it's not in the TCFD report, that's really the basis of what we used. Um, speaking of incredibly smart and effective women, it's really a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Sharon Selman from the D Director of Climate Strategy at Many Life. Um, and just want to talk to you about how is TCFD a helpful tool for you? Some of the key things you're doing, what are some of the management tools and how does this do you think will affect uh, the competitive nature that you're in? But again, thank you for being here and thank you more importantly for all that you're doing. Sharon, over to you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you for the lovely introduction and having me here. So climate-related risks and opportunities are definitely a significant consideration across our operations as well as our investments and how we think about uh, products and services. And is definitely the underlying strategic foundation when we think about our climate action plan and some of the commitments that you see on your screen there under our climate action plan. When it comes to uh, climate disclosure across whether that be industries, sectors, and regions, it's really important because it really allows us to understand um, and accurately, accurately assess and manage risks to us as well as from us. So by understanding this from a double materiality uh, perspective, um, really allows us to develop appropriate risk management strategies um, and processes to really make sure we are addressing some of these risks appropriately across our operations investments, as well as our products and services from both the physical and transition risk perspective. In addition to our journey to really being net zero at Manulife, uh, we're really taking steps to improve the resilience of our business uh, in the face of a changing climate. And of course, as a long-term underwriter and investor, climate-related risks and opportunities, including some of those changes that we see in the physical environment, as well as policy and technological changes uh, that we see when it comes to transitioning to a low carbon economy are very strategically relevant to us and something that we continue to consider in our, in our development. And of course, the TCFD recommendations, though, really allows for consistent and comparable reporting when it comes to climate related risk and opportunity. And we have been supporting uh, the TCFD since 2017 and continue to align uh, and adapt some of those disclosure practices when it comes to the framework and the recommendations. So going into the questions, um, so when we think about climate risk and opportunity disclosure across the four TCFD pillars, there are several ways in which it's really important to us in addition to the risk management perspective of things. So 
One being the regulatory compliance view, and I think Laura touched on this as well. Um, so regulatory bodies, we know, are increasingly encouraging and or mandating uh, TCFT disclosure for financial institutions, including insurance companies. And by complying with these disclosure requirements, insurers really demonstrate their commitment uh, to both transparency as well as accountability. And it also helps insurance really stay up to date with evolving regulatory frameworks related to climate and really avoid any risks associated with non-compliance. And secondly, bringing in the investor and stakeholder perspective. So increasingly, investors and stakeholders are demanding greater transparency from financial institutions when it comes to disclosure on climate-related risks and opportunities. And the TCFD framework really enables insurance, insurers to meet these expectations um, in a standardized way by sharing standardized information on how climate change uh, impacts our operations, as well as our ability to manage those associated risks. The third one I'll touch on is that insurance companies um, that proactively really disclose climate related risks as well as their strategies through TCFD can really showcase their leadership when it comes to the industry and the sector overall. And this level of transparency allows um, companies and insurers to really demonstrate their commitment to sustainability as well as showcase some of their responsible business practices and the proactive uh, manner in which some of those risks associated with climate are managed across the organization. And the last thing I'll call out is the long-term resiliency perspective of it all. Climate change, we know, is a long-term matter with far-reaching health implications. And for life and health insurance companies, they need to really understand and ensure the long-term resilience of the, the uh, of these issues to really be on top of some of those risks and to ensure that we are managing those risks in an appropriate manner. And the TC TCFD disclosure really aids us in identifying um, you know, potential physical and transition risks associated to climate change and really allows uh, insurers to develop strategies that protect their policyholders and adapt products and services to the changing conditions as well as effectively, manner, um, as effectively manage its investments in a low carbon manner. And to answer your very last question, Stephen, on how understanding our peers, um, you know, suppose our disclosure journey. So there are two ways in which we can use um, peer disclosure to really advance our impact. First being uh, benchmarking best practices and identifying opportunities. So for us, by analyzing our peers' climate risk disclosure, Manulife can really benchmark our own efforts against industry peers and you know, identify some of those best practices that are out there. And this really allows us to um, you know, understand how we compare again our peers in terms of climate risk management, but also it allows us to identify areas for opportunity where we should be improving and further enhancing some of the practices that we have internally. So it, it's, uh, it's not just a tap on the shoulder to, like, you know, on our back to say, hey, we've done a good job, but it also really points out some of those gaps associated with areas that we should be doing more. And the second one I'll call out is uh, you know, collaboration and collective action. So understanding our peers' efforts when it comes to climate risk can really facilitate collaboration and collective action within the insurance industry. And we can use this information to engage with our peers, to share knowledge, and you know, work together on initi initiatives that are aimed to really addressing climate change uh, in a collective manner to make sure that we manage those risks appropriately. The thought that I'll end off with is that Overall, uh, you know, comprehensive climate disclosure is important because it provides a good view as to how companies' um, climate-related risks and opportunities um, are considered across the organization in a very standardized, transparent manner. And by understanding these things, organizations can really make informed decisions to really advance the positive impact when it comes to that organization and ensure that all the processes and management practices are in place to mitigate those associated risks. That's great, Sharon. Thank you. So, sorry, Sharon. Thank you so much for those thoughtful comments. And again, more importantly, what you do every day and the leadership that you show by saying, hey, we've done all these things, but we need to continue to look at that. And using this as a tool, one of many tools to help look at that is great. So thank you for doing that. I'm going to now ask uh, Mike Peterson to join. Mike is, again, the uh, Deputy Commissioner for Climate and Sustainability from the state of California. Thank you, Mike, for all that you and your colleagues do to join me to answer some questions. I'm gonna take the first one, and but if there are other guests, any of our other speakers who wanna join, feel free. 
So first is, I just want to recognize that uh, Dave Jones has asked a question. Dave is a former insurance commissioner from California. Thanks, Dave, for being here and for all of your historic leadership on this. And then one of the questions is, are you concerned about companies learning the quote unquote correct way, correct language to use when reporting so their answers are scored better? Not really, because the, the machine learning analysis is just a first step. Ultimately, it's what Sharon and what others said, is that companies and regulators are going to use it, and now they can go to detail. They're going to say, gee, I want to look at how companies are doing on risk management or governance, and I'm going to read the company's reports and see the language. We're also very clear that there is not, quote, a way to do it. Companies are at different places. If you're a PNC company or a healthcare company or, or, or life, again, the needs may be different. TCFD is important for all of them. So that's another question that was asked, but in, in different ways. So we view this as a foundation, a floor for the analysis, not, not, the, not the ceiling. But Mike, let me turn it over to you to see if you want to add anything on that or we can go to the next question. You no, know, I'll just underscore that there's a diversity of companies within the insurance sector. And so there's a diversity of strategies. And you know, one of the things that I think is most encouraging from this review of those TCFD reports is that you you do have tangible examples of different strategies used for different scenarios. And so I think that um, we're going to be able to, to see that as regulators, and, and that will help risk assessment and risk mitigation moving forward. But, but yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Stephen. Great. Another question is, I work for a smaller life and health insurance company. What are you hoping to see companies do from an industry norm to mitigate climate risk and lower admission? I know we have electric charging stations for employees, for installers, solar panels at our home offices, uh, try to reduce brick and mortar location. Um, all of those things are great, but that's really thinking about your um, scope one, kind of your operations. The biggest impact that uh, every insurer is making is through both your underwriting and your investments. So, and again, not just generally, it's what are you underwriting? What are you not underwriting? What are the policies? There are companies that are forward thinking about some of the new technologies. There are some what, where they decide to exit a market or not exit a market. Again, there's no one answer, but so there's lots of decisions on the underwriting uh, that are important. Clearly the home office and those things are important, but the underwriting and then your investment portfolio. You know, there are trillions of dollars of assets uh, that the insurance companies own overall. We're finishing actually another report we'll be releasing in August on that. So look at those two areas. But let me see if, Mike, if you want to add anything on either of those. You know, you know just very, very briefly, I think that the um, the one of the benefits of the TCFD report uh, approach is that you balance this consistency of the pillars with the flexibility to really focus on what um, is the risks that are um, being presented to specific types of companies. And so, you know, we don't have a prescription for what any particular company should do, but this framework allows you to look at the context of what other peers might be doing and, and, and sort of re review what, what you are doing um, and what are your strategies that address the risks that you're seeing um, from your business. Um, thank you. Thank you. Another question is, are there mechanisms to make sure that the insurer's response are truthful? Well, first, I give the NAIC and the, and, and the regulators credit because they're all public so that anyone can look at any of them. They can go on the California website there. And so we believe in the marketplace that uh, if there is good information out there um, that and, and again, with under a regulatory structure, so sort of look at that so that essentially if if something is and, and I'm not saying there is, but if there's something that is not completely truthful, I think the market will sort it out and there'll be people looking at those. And over time, again, this is the first year, uh, first analysis. We from a serious perspective, we would assume the TCFD reports in future years will be more even more. These are great for first year. I give it the regulators and the insurers enormous credit for how far they've come, um, not just in the number, um, but in the robustness, having read a lot of these, and it's fascinating. But, you know, we also, there's a lot more to do. And so that we think a lot more will be covered there. But Mike, let me turn this over to you if you want to answer that, or or feel free, Mike, to respond to anything else that was said earlier. I'm, I'm just going to continue to, to, to underscore or highlight you know, some of the responses that you've made, Stephen, but, but I'll, I'll just really focus on this. The a core goal here is to promote strong risk assessment and risk mitigation within the insurance sector. And so I think that the TCFD consistency and the narrative responses um, are going to promote that and, you know, really make best practices kind of emerge um, for different types of, of companies and, and sectors. And so I, I think that 
this report that got released this week just shows like the importance of getting started and of getting that information um, out there. And so I just, I really think that the, the core here is risk assessment and risk mitigation. And we have a collection of companies that are, are taking a diversity of strategies to get there. And we, we now can see some of those tangible examples. So um, I, I, th I think it's been a really strong first step. Um, final question that we're going to get to, I'm going to have Mike go first, but I'd also ask, um, we're going to be sending everyone a copy of this link and it'll include my email. So if there's additional questions or if we didn't get to them, uh, you know, feel free. So Mike, uh, how should we think about paying for climate change risk? What are the responsibilities of governments, consumers, insurance companies? I think it's a big public policy question that's being, um, you know, felt in a number of different industries, in, in, including the in the insurance sector. Um, you know, much of the focus I think that we've put on is is that when you get ahead of risk, you mitigate risk. Um, that's where the most cost savings is located. Every dollar of um, risk reduction to to structures saves, you know, five to ten dollars in. Um, the costs after a disaster. And so that there really is a focus on how to best help um, the insurance sector reduce risks before an event happens. Um, and, I, and I think that that's where we're going to kind of keep our priority. Great, great. So there are a lot more, again, we're happy if we, as, as long as we have your email, we're happy to follow up with you or, or mine. Um, but thank you, Michael. Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, one of the other questions was, can there be more analysis? So for example, could it be by state that you're domiciled in? Yes, that's not what we've done, but there can be follow-up work. So if there's questions about, or you want to compare other things, let us know and either we can help or put you in touch with the right people. So with that, I'm going to just thank you and ask my colleague just to put up the slides again while she's doing that. I also want to thank everyone at Ceres who's worked on this. Uh, There's so many people. I particularly want to note Monica for all the work that's happened on this. So if you can go back to the slide just before. Um, for directors, whether it be at insurance companies or others, we're offering a course with University of Michigan, uh, an online course for boards of directors and people who advise boards of directors. So happy to share information about climate and a variety of environmental social governance issues. Next slide. If anyone wants more information on this freedom to invest in response to the anti-ESG, if you go to freedomtoinvest.org, we have information there. And then in um, uh, next slide, uh, we're having an event in, in October in San Francisco. For those of you, we'd love to have you join. And I think the last slide, next slide is an evaluation. So we'll also send this out again in the um, email you get, but or you can take a picture of this. We want your feedback. Is this helpful? What information? How can we be helpful for you? So thank you all for your time. Thank you for all of the amazing speakers. Uh, again, we easily could have spent another few hours with all of them. I hope the report, both reports and the uh, this webinar is helpful and look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you all again. Have a great day. Bye-bye.